the whole world is watching Eastern Europe and wondering if the supposedly peaceful continent of Europe will embark upon another war and if Russia will invade Ukraine. Even more importantly, will the U.S. get involved? Putin has made many statements suggesting war is near, and many nations such as Germany and the U.S. urge their citizens to leave Ukraine as soon as possible. President Biden has effectively said that we ought to prepare for a Russian invasion in the days to come. Many people are asking the fateful questions of, will Russia invade Ukraine? Why is Russia acting in this manner? What would the result be? And even more broadly, would this result in a world war? This is the video to look at the Ukraine situation and Russia's broader geopolitical problems while answering all of those questions. Keeping up with current situations can be a lot, and digging up on historical information isn't much easier, but Wondrium has everything you need. You've heard me talk at the Great Courses Plus beforehand on this show, but they've recently gone through some changes to improve their viewing experience and have renamed themselves Wondrium. Wondrium is an online streaming service with a great collection of short and long-form videos, tutorials, how-tos, documentaries, and more. I was watching a fascinating program about ancient pagan cultures, and it talked about how the priests in ancient India became so obsessed with ritual that it was often as if they believed that they'd enslaved the gods to their own whims. Wondrium has many documentaries, and I love to use them to study subjects that fascinate me. Everything on Wondrium is academically comprehensive, thoroughly researched, incredibly entertaining, and presented by engaging experts. Wondrium is really just a great place to learn about anything from history, science, and technology, or anything else that you've ever wondered about. Wondrium's got the answer to so many questions you've thought about, and for my fans I'm offering a special deal. Use the link in the description to go to wondrium.com to get a free trial and start exploring the world today. Our story starts a thousand years ago when both modern Russia and Ukraine were unified under the Rus nation, in which the Vikings ruled over the local Slavic population. However, the central Rus kingdom collapsed into fighting princelings and then was divided into two broad regions. The eastern segment, or the area that became Russia, was conquered by the Mongols. The Mongols are some of the most brutal rulers of anyone in history, and Russia was the area they governed the most brutally. Beforehand, Russia was a wealthy, cosmopolitan, and developed region. But the Mongols drove it into poverty, isolated it from the rest of the world, and even established the authoritarian government structures that later Russian regimes used. Russia became the dominant Slavic nation in Eastern Europe, since the Mongols were so brutal that the Russians developed an unbelievable sense of grit, stoicism, and unity in order to survive the Mongols. Ukraine and Belarus were meanwhile conquered by Lithuania, and then Poland, or Catholic Western nations. The Poles were often chauvinistic and brutally ensurfed the local populations, but nothing to the degree of what the Mongols did. This meant that Ukraine has sort of been a bridge between Western influence and Russian, stuck between the two. As an example, Western Ukraine had to agree to join the Catholic Church because of their Polish rulers, but they kept the old Orthodox theology and rites. Russia then conquered Ukraine over the 17th and 18th centuries, which was a complicated process that illustrates Ukraine's relationship with Russia, and at certain points the Ukrainians would work with the Russian authorities, viewing each other as orthodox brothers, and other times would rebel under the banner of Ukrainian nationalism. However, until the fall of the Soviet Union, Ukraine was part of the Russian nation, actually being called Lesser Russia or Little Russia, while Belarus, which is culturally very similar to Ukraine, being called White Russia. However, Ukraine's been an independent country for the last 30 years since the fall of the Soviet Union. The parallels between modern Ukrainian and Russian identities are pretty similar to the Union and the Confederacy in American history. The Confederates viewed themselves as an independent nation with their own history and culture that the North was trying to crush. Meanwhile, the Northerners viewed the South as an integral part of their nation and the Southerners as secessionist traitors. Now, the tricky situation is that both the Northerners and Southerners would be right. On the Southern side, the South has been an independent cultural region since America was first settled, and those differences are definitely big enough that the South could count as an independent country. I mean, hell, American Southerners are genetically distinct enough from Northerners that they can count as a different ethnic group. Meanwhile, on the Northern side, the South has worked with us since the Revolution. Many of the great Pan-American leaders, like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, etc., were Southern. 
America is a diverse country, and in the global scheme of things, the South isn't super culturally different, and the South legally agreed to join the unified country. These are the sort of complications a Ukrainian and Russian nationalist would fight over. An Ukrainian nationalist would bring up the Cossacks and the various anti-Russian rebellions, while a Russian would bring up their shared struggles together against the Nazis or Napoleon. A Ukrainian nationalist would fire back with that they have an independent language, and the Russian would say that Ukrainian and Russian speakers are mutually intelligible. The problem here is that ethnicity and identity are tied up in politics. Ukrainians are a separate ethnicity when they have guns to protect it, and they're part of Russian culture when they're weak. I mean, we even see this in Western Europe, where you could easily have changed events to make the Dutch Germans or make the Occitan independent from France. However, this belies the Ukrainian identity is weak enough relatively that the Russians can view them as a subset of Russians. When we look at Ukrainian politics since its independence from the Soviet Union, we see a country that's been poised precariously between the Western and Russian worlds. In the early 2000s, they flirted with the European Union, and in 2014, they were entering into negotiations to develop a closer relationship with the European Union, which might have eventually resulted in them joining it, but this was blocked by the Russian-speaking dictator Yanukovych. There were protests against this in the capital, Kiev, which were supported by the United States and Western Europe. These protests were violent, and under pressure, Yanukovych stepped down from power, and a pro-Western government was elected. However, this disturbed Russia for reasons we're going to explain soon, and Russia invaded the eastern part of the country, as well as Crimea, which are Russian-speaking, effectively annexing them. Ukraine since then has been in a really rough position. It's basically stuck between a rock and a hard place, or Russia on the west, unable to really work with either and isolated. Ukraine has become one of the poorest countries in Europe, while having the continent's most fertile soil and a respectable industrial base. Ukraine is scarred to work with Russia, since any closer cooperation will effectively result in their annexation. Well, they also can't cooperate with the West, since Russia will invade them, if they become too pro-Western, and the West isn't really keen on Ukraine's corruption. Like Russia, Ukraine didn't make the switch between communism to capitalism cleanly, and in a lot of ways got the worst of both systems. The government became corrupt while, unlike Russia, still being democratic. The economic system became dominated by oligarchs who hurt the economy. While well, Russia, who should realistically be their biggest trade partner by a large factor, is waging a trade war against them. For those of you that saw my video on Taiwan, this is in a lot of ways the European parallel. In both cases, an authoritarian country is using a splinter nation that they consider part of their homeland as a way of unifying their populations to counter domestic problems. Russia has two major problems that likely destroy their nation over the next few decades, and Ukraine is a desperate attempt at survival. The first and driving problem, and we've talked about this ad nauseum on this show, but only because it's likely the main driving force of the next few decades, is their demographic situation. Russia has one of the worst birth rates in the world, and unlike other parts of the world, they've had one since the 1970s, meaning this is a problem that they're already decades into, and is basically impossible to solve. Russia will see their population halve over the next few decades. Unlike Germany or Japan, they're not seeing crippling aging, which sounds good, but it's largely since their men drink themselves to death, living a whole decade shorter than similar nations. Russia's birth rate's 1.5, which is half a child short of being stable, but this problem is compounded by the birth rate being driven up by Muslim minorities. The ethnic Slavs that Russia's built off have an even lower birth rate. The Muslims in Russia have proud histories going back centuries, which involve raiding and conquering the Slavs, and so if they get to a big enough percentage of the population, they'll almost certainly try to secede. I mean, the only thing that kept Chechnya from seceding already is the Russian government basically giving itself governance. We don't have any parallel for what rapid population collapse would look like, but the effects would almost certainly be completely disastrous. I mean, more old people means more money taken out of the economy, which means young people have less money to have kids invest in businesses and the like. Shrinking the pie across history almost always results in civil wars and wars of aggression as the previous social understandings collapse. Which brings up another one of Russia's problems, its geography. Russia is a country marked by wide open flat land, which is why Russia can be so big, because there aren't a lot of big geographic barriers. The other side of this is that Russia had to expand as much as possible across its history since it has no geographic barriers to protect it. The only things that protect Russia are sheer distance, the grit of the Russian people, and general winter. So as Russia goes into freefall due to its demographic situation, their geography won't help them either. 
Unlike a country like China, which faces similar demographic problems, there are only a bit over 100 million Russians, unlike the 1.5 billion Chinese. If China screws up, there will always be a China. If Russia screws up, much of the country can be eaten up by the Muslims and the Chinese could populate the East. I mean, there are 200 million people on the Chinese side of the border and four on the Russian. A final problem in Russia is the society. It's really interesting to see how societies move across history with what elements they keep and which ones change over time. The Russia of today is much in common with it in the 16th century, with various oligarchs controlling the country while the Tsar, I mean president, based out of Moscow works with them to control the Russian nation, while using the secret police and orthodox religion to buttress his power. However, the key difference between now and the 16th century is that Russia was then a country on the upswing. Russia had a massive birth rate that was basically pouring out of its borders. Russia was pushing its borders in every direction, becoming wealthier, better organized, and the Russians were completely united by belief in the orthodox faith and loyalty to the Tsar. It's the opposite today, where due to the communists gutting their society, Russia is a nation without hope. Russia's population is collapsing, and there's a reason its men are drinking itself to death. Russia is controlled by various oligarchic interests that make honest work difficult to do. The political system is cruel and autocratic. The government is effectively an alliance of the haves to maintain power at the expense of economic growth or freedom. There's more Russian rubles and banks outside Russia than inside it for a reason. Educated and ambitious Russians leave for a reason. Russia has been a repressive poor state its entire modern history, but it used to be brimming with confidence and energy. Now Russia is a nation that just wants to lie down and cry. It's very difficult to get societies to turn around from this suicidal feeling of lost hope. I can't find a single example of it across history. However, the main character trait you can give the Russians credit for is unbelievable stoicism. This is the nation that fought off the Mongols, Nazis, Napoleon, and so many others. Here, a country that was nearly conquered by the Germans twice in a 50-year period, bloodied in a civil war, brutally repressed by possibly the most evil tyrant ever, and still became one of the most powerful nations in the world. Do not underestimate the Russians. When the Russians drive for Ukraine, they're trying to protect their western border. If the United States or the European Union, which is literally a union of American allies, were to bring Ukraine as their alliance structures, the Russians would immediately declare war and invade. This is because Ukraine's the front door to Moscow. Moscow and the Russian industrial heartland are very close to the Ukrainian border, and so if the West secures Ukraine in an alliance, Russia would just lose any war. An important variable is that Ukraine's neighbor to the north is Belarus, which is basically a Russian puppet state. Belarus is culturally similar to Ukraine in being both a part and not being a part of Russia. And Russia and Belarus have been talking about unifying for decades, but have never really gotten around to it. Although I'm not sure, I think the events in Kazakhstan might be a similar camp in which the anti-Russian rebels were butchered by the Russians to support their allied government. I don't know what Russia's plans for Kazakhstan are, but I think if they want Ukraine and Belarus, then Kazakhstan with its large ethnic Russian minority is the next logical step. Why I think Putin's trying to push for Ukraine now is that the world stands in a precipice, with COVID dragging on longer and longer, and the Biden administration might appear less aggressive than the previous Trump one. I think a really important factor is that lots of people, including myself, predict a horrifying recession very soon. Russia's economy is already shaky, and so a recession would just further weaken Putin's power. At the same time, lots of people think Russia's demographics are about to hit a tipping point very soon, meaning Russia doesn't have a lot of time. And in general, modern wars are normally driven off existential crises that force people's hands. As an example, both Germany and Japan would have probably seen their economies collapse if they hadn't started World War II. An important thing to understand about Putin is that he's intelligent, but he and his elite make decisions entirely based off maintaining their power. And that's the logic that they've done in economic, foreign, and other policies. So Putin could act in a very reckless and aggressive way if he felt it was the necessary thing towards maintaining his own power. I think Putin's trying to create a symbol to the Russian people of the strength and unity of the Russian people as things get worse. At the same time, he's trying to get more secure borders as Russia becomes weaker due to its demographic problems. It's in effect an offensive defense. An incredibly important variable is that Russia and China are in an alliance of convenience, along with the countries in between against America. China is, as we speak, massing a massive force to looks like what would be an invasion of Taiwan. I think there's no way in hell China and Russia aren't coordinating for invasions at the same time, with understanding of the other. 
Having its two main enemies attack it at the same time would throw the U.S. off guard and make it so it'd be difficult to deal with the situation in a rational or effective way. Let's say that Russia invades Ukraine. We're going to ignore the possibility that China also invades Taiwan at the same time, which is covered in this video, and look only at the European front of the war. So, how would the war play out? The big question is whether or not the US gets involved. I could have told you no, since first of all the geography plays into Russia's hands, with that Ukraine is a funnel in which the border with Russia is long and flat, and gradually shrinks due to the Pripyat marshes to Ukraine's northwest and the Carpathians to Ukraine's southwest. Thus, attacking Ukraine from the east is very easy, while defending it from the west is very hard. The U.S. should strategically hold this line in a war with Russia, one anchored in Poland's the military power of the region, the Carpathian Mountains, and then to the Black Sea. If the U.S. tries to hold any line east of this, it will lose. Ukraine is also part of the Orthodox and not Western civilization. This means more than you'd think. Take the Baltics that are Protestant, Nordic, capitalist, wealthy societies. Americans would almost certainly fight to defend the Baltics since they're too culturally similar. Finally, Ukraine never joined the American alliance structure, NATO, and has never decided to put itself under American protection. If the Chinese invade Taiwan at the same time as a Russian invasion of Ukraine, that, that gives the U.S. even less reason to protect Ukraine. A very key factor is nuclear weapons, in that the U.S. and Russia have almost all the nukes in the world and are the only nations that are really capable of causing a nuclear holocaust. However, neither country has any desire to end the human race, and so I think nukes play against the chance of a war. And my job is made even easier by President Biden literally saying the U.S. wouldn't fight over Ukraine. However, the mass movement of troops to American allies surrounding Ukraine suggests that the U.S. will fight viciously to protect its allies like Poland, the Baltics, or Romania. If the Russians invade Ukraine without Americans fighting there, they will conquer the country in a matter of weeks. Ukraine can't offer serious resistance. I've heard an interesting theory that the Russians might attack after the end of the Beijing Olympics on February 20th, which their allies the Chinese have invested a significant amount of money into, and before the spring thaw. You see, very ironically and contrary to public opinion, the best times to launch attacks in Eastern Europe are the winter and the summer. In the summer for obvious reasons, but you can drive tanks over snow and frozen rivers pretty easily. The main problem is just having your troops freeze to death. The spring in Eastern Europe is brutally muddy and very difficult to move troops around in. Thus, I could see the Russians attacking in the winter, seizing Ukraine, and then stabilizing their position over the spring when they have the defensive advantage. I could see the Russians making a big gesture at this point, too, of unifying Ukraine, Belarus, and maybe Kazakhstan into a sort of union state at this point to show the strength of the Russian nation and them regaining glory since the fall of the Soviet Union. The question at this point is, would this devolve into a war with the United States? One answer is that for whatever reason, possibly the Russians want a war, and then it just escalates. Both countries are outfitting as if they'd fight a war, and I don't know if that's just deterrence. The second is that wars in international politics are just chaotic by nature, which means that events could eventually culminate in a war, without that being the intention going in. World War I was caused by a series of small, rational decisions that added up to madness. For example, Poland might intervene to protect Ukraine, thus pulling America into the conflict, or the U.S. might launch a trade embargo on Russia, thus provoking Russia to war. When you throw in other areas of the world, either the Middle East or involving China, it means there's a lot of matches lying around to light the dynamite. An important consideration is that if the U.S. is a war with China or Russia, said countries likely launch an economic attack in the United States, which, given the weakness of the American economy, would likely have horrible effects on society. If the U.S. and Russia have a war, the Baltics would be seized immediately. The Russians have this weird possession split off from the rest of Russia and what used to be Prussia, and using Belarus as their ally, they could split off the Baltics with ease. They would then smash into Poland and Romania. Both Russia and America have agreed not to use nukes in a conflict, and I know agreements go away with war, but I don't think either country is willing to gamble the end of modern civilization, and so would stick to conventional weapons. In fact, nuclear weapons would probably be a way of preventing total war in that, say, the U.S. wouldn't bomb Russia itself for fear of nuclear retaliation. In fact, if either side's losing the war badly, the threat of nuclear war would likely bring a white peace before things would get too ugly and vindictive. The big question for this front is how much punch the Russians can hit with in their initial attacks versus what's going on in the Chinese front. 
The Russians have a pretty small economy and industrial base, but have one of the strongest militaries in the world. How strong, it's hard to say, though. My bet is that if the Russians can knock out Poland, the main linchpin of the anti-Russian alliance of American allies, called the Three Seas Initiative, it would mean that Germany, which is a nation that has good relations with Russia, and is wealthy, has a weak military, and is traumatized by war and fighting in general, will cut a deal with the Russians, probably backed by the French, thus pushing the Americans off the European continent. This conflict would be decided in Poland. Heroism is required of the Poles, and they basically need to hold out until they could be reinforced by the Americans or Western Europeans adequately. A vital factor is what China's involvement will finally entail. If the U.S. is fighting a land war with China, that would suck up the bulk of American troops, given that China has four times America's population, while Russia has half of America's. If the U.S. isn't putting its entire energies into fighting the Russians, that gives the Russians a much better fighting chance. In fact, I can see if the Russians see that they're losing a war to America, cutting a deal with America to turn on China. The Russians have always been kind of slimy, but also extremely effective diplomatically, and they dislike and are scared of the Chinese anyway. In summary, I would say that the world is becoming a chaotic place, and we're often used to imagining our lives as stable, easy places. We live with electric appliances and modern houses or apartments, so history's over, right? However, in the days that come, even if Russia or China don't launch invasions, we will have to learn what it means to live through history. So many things are possible here. War, peace, Russian or American victory, financial, cyber, or conventional war. There are decades in which nothing happens and days in which decades happen. History is in the air today. I wish us all the best for the events ahead. What if Altist and thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for additional content. Alternatively, check out my Pearl page, which is launching soon, as well as my Patreon, where I've got the first couple hundred pages of my cultural history of America and history of the world. As always, thanks for watching and have a great day.